All right, man, peace. So, brothers, this is going to be volume one in a new series that I'm starting called Black Man, Do You Need Help? And as we can all see, it's going to be featuring Mr. Ron Artest, the former star small forward of the Chicago Bulls, the Indiana Pacers, the Houston Rockets, the L.A. Lakers, etc. And the reason why I'm making this series is because it's very obvious to me that there are many brothers out there who need assistance spiritually and mentally because they've never been informed or taught how to think, how to handle the issues that they have from a lot of the mental baggage that they still carry around due to being raised in many of these toxic households. For whatever reason, that household happened to be toxic. Whether it was a black matriarchal household or there was a man in the home who was inept at leadership, rulership, or teaching. And that's another point that I just want to touch on very quickly. Just because you happen to be a so-called man does not make you a leader. You have to have some information to impart onto your children. That's why I always tell cats, do not have a child if you know that you're not ready, if you have no wisdom to share. And I'm talking about proactive wisdom. I'm not talking about reactive wisdom. Well, you're some dude who can only teach your son how to stay out of prison because you were there. Not that there's anything wrong with that if that's part of your life experience. But we have to have more proactive things to teach our children. That's why I have this series called Black Man Protect Your Seed because most of the issues that we have as a so-called community derive from the fact that the so-called black man is not holding his seed to the level of importance that we need to. It's very important. Once again, brothers, none of us are perfect, but we do have to hold ourselves and our seed line to a far higher regard. Our seed is more valuable than gold, silver, diamonds, oil, whatever you want to name. Our seed is much more valuable than those things. So once we start to understand that, watch how much better our lives become and also how much better our children's lives become because a lot of these children out here, you can tell they've been through a hell of a lot, man. Only 10, 11, 12 years old and they're going home to a cesspool. And we as black men, we have to try to controvert these destructive atmospheres, man. It's very important, extremely essential. So anyway, they're gonna talk about it and I'm gonna chime in. I remember thinking my first sale, there was a crackhead who would always come and buy it from my family. I remember giving the crackhead the money and just running back in the house. I didn't even take the money and my cousin was like, yo, where the money at? I'm like, yo, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't have time to take the money. In other words, brother, you were not built for that vocation, and that's a good thing. I get into a little back and forth with a lot of these pro blackity blacks who run into my comment section when I talk about police brutality and how that's the number one issue in the so-called black community. No, the number one issue in the so-called black community is that the so-called black man does not value himself to a high enough degree to understand how to value his own brother. Because once we understand those things, then we're going to stop treating one another with the lack of regard and respect that we're treating each other with. But first and foremost, we have to reconnect with the Most High because that's what's going to guide us appropriately. There are so many quote unquote black Luciferians running around. These dudes who talk about how they're their own God, but they never have any solutions. They love to talk about how they are their own God, how the black woman is God. But when you ask them, what is your process to assist the so-called black man and woman to ascend out of this issue that we're in which is a spiritual issue they never have any answers all they could do is try to inundate you with a lot of empty rhetoric because they're not really about anything so we have to return back to the source and we have to humble ourselves to the most high once the so-called black man does that watch how much easier life becomes watch how much easier it is to make good decisions how we live our lives the people that we allow into our lives to quote unquote cast our lives as Jimmy Iovine would say it's very important to know how to cast your life, meaning who to allow into your vicinity, who to allow into your circle, whether it be a male or a female. It's very important. But it's a good thing, just getting back to Ron Artest, that he felt a sense of guilt when he attempted to engage in his first drug sale. That means that he has a conscience. A lot of these same pro-blackity blacks will tell you about how the white supremacy world is creating this, this police force that's allowed to kill blacks with impunity will try to make excuses for drug dealing in the so-called black community, which is a far greater problem than the quote unquote problem of police brutality. Is police brutality an issue? Of course it is. But it's certainly not a top five issue, most likely not even a top 10 issue. 
we have interior issues, we have intraracial issues that we have to work out. And once we're able to do that, a lot of the police brutality problems will go by the wayside because we know how to govern ourselves. So-called black people do not know how to govern ourselves. We have no confidence in administrative tasks. We have no confidence as planners. It's a major issue. When I say we, of course, I'm not talking about all black people. I'm just talking about a good amount of us. We have issues with confidence and being leaders and planners, particularly the so-called black man, particularly the so-called black man. And part of that is the black matriarchal archetype or the black matriarchal paradigm, I should say, that exists in the so-called black community where little black boys are raised to believe that it's natural to have an overseer known as the liberal black woman always barking down on you and telling you what to do. That's not natural. That's not fruitful. That's not constructive. I was scared. I was scared to sell to be selling drugs, quite honestly. You know, I didn't like it. I didn't like the feeling. Good for you, brother. Oh, well, um, it just was not for me. It was that simple. I knew right then and there I was not going to be a drug dealer. Okay, that was a clip from the new Showtime documentary, Quiet Storm, premieres Friday night at Metal World Peace. Welcome back mm -hmm. to Undisputed. Thanks, Thanks for welcome. <laughs> so good to have you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I watched the documentary, and it is, it's pretty powerful. Thanks. And I can imagine going into it and just retelling your story in that way. Why was it important to you, and why did you want to tell your story to make well, this documentary? Well, originally I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to, like, revisit those times. And, you know, it, it was kind of emotional. And... Uh, Johnny Sweet said, let's do it. People want to like it. I'm like, why do people want to hear about me? Like, I'm not even relevant. I don't need to do it. It's a good thing, though, brother, because what you'll do, hopefully, is encourage a lot of other so-called black men who are carrying around emotional, mental, psychological, spiritual baggage from their youth to be more encouraged to face their demons. A lot of cats out here have not faced their demons. We have to do that so that we can grow as people and leave a lot of that shit in the past, man. What we do is we create these veneers and these facades of, of machismo and we never get to the crux of the matter. And we bring a very acerbic energy to all of our relationships and a lot of times we end up sabotaging all of our relationships because of baggage that you had from when you was five or six years old. A good example of that is the film Antoine Fisher, directed by Denzel Washington, starring Denzel Washington and Derek Luke. Well, we did it. You know, and I mean, they just turned it out, and I, I cried like three times during a doc. I'm like, this is way too much. <laughs> you know, it's crazy, but it's good. Yeah. So I also watched it start to finish last night, and the reason I finished is that I couldn't stop watching it. And I promise you, if you start, what, it, what is it, Friday night? Yes. Uh, um, Ten o'clock Eastern, Eastern on Eastern. Showtime. Showtime. If you start, you won't be able to stop because it's a compelling story. It was a compelling story. I was like, wow, the Negroes go through all that shit. With a happy ending. And I hope you think it was a happy ending because that's how it played to me. Yeah. Well, he's still alive. So if you want to consider that a happy ending, we can consider it that. I consider people like Ron Artest and Mike Tyson two peas in the same pod. A couple of cats who became successful. But it's very obvious that they went through hell to get there. And a lot of the hell that we go through is self-caused hell. And I'm sure that many of the pro-blackity blacks are not going to like that. They're going to point the finger once again at the so-called white man. Because a lot of pro-blackity blacks, well, most pro-blackity blacks are not spiritual in any way. They're unable to evaluate their condition from a three-dimensional perspective. And they're unable to sense the spiritual aspect of the condition that our people are in. They only comprehend the carnal. And a carnal solution is never going to assist in a spiritual problem. Therefore, you have no solution whatsoever. All they can do is ramble on and on and on and on. But when you look at someone like Aron Artest, he's going to state that he grew up in a household, in an environment where he had a very supportive father. But there's another thing, brothers. If you knew that you grew up in a bad environment and you're intelligent enough to understand that and not just embrace the quote-unquote hood mentality, then maybe we should not have a child until we can afford to raise them in a better neighborhood so that the demons that were put on us are not put on them. That's the point. Generation upon generation, you're supposed to live a better life than the previous generation did. That's what's called progress. Like, for example, 
my great grandfather, he was a sharecropper. My grandfather, he was also a farmer. He's from Virginia. He served in World War II. My father, he was able to enter into the business world. He was also in the military. Me, myself, I have more avenues to express myself than my great grandfather had. But generation upon generation, we're supposed to be trying to build and get better. It doesn't make any sense to grow up in the projects and talk about how bad your neighborhood is and oh by the way, I'm gonna have a son and I wanna raise my son in this bullshit so that he can end up being just like me. Sometimes we have to think on a more grandiose scale. This is crazy like having a career like I did and not being in it mentally and you can see like well I really wasn't engaged mm. in the game. And so I really wish I was. My takeaway yeah. from the whole thing, and by the way, you grew up in Queensbridge, and, and it's the large, I didn't know this, it's the largest housing project in North America. It's I guess Skip has never heard of Nas. <laughs> Skip always trying to act like he, he listened to hip hop. If he knew about Nas, he would have known about QB. Six blocks, you're 4108 10th Street, right in the middle of it. But from the start, your greatest strength was also your biggest weakness, and it was your your temper. Because yeah. when you fueled your, your anger, you were... Oh, I, I remember when I was on the show Cold Pizza on ESPN in 0304, I was making a case that you had emerged as an MVP candidate. That Ron Artest was one of the most dominant defensive players of the last 25 years. A lot of people, of course, are not going to remember or acknowledge this, but Ron Artest in his prime played a Kawhi Leonard, a Scottie Pippen, a Dennis Rodman in the late 80s level of perimeter defense on the two guard or the three man. Some people might know this story, others might not. But when Michael Jordan was prepping to make his comeback with the Wizards, Ron Artest was the player that he liked to defend him in many of the scrimmages. And Ron Artest was so physical with him that he ended up breaking one of Michael Jordan's ribs. Here, that's the year you won defensive player of the year. And you could be when you chose to be, because you were very unselfish, you could be unstoppably unstoppable on offense. But lockdown defender, like Kobe said, I'm not sure there's ever been a better one when, when you were angry with Paul Pierce, whoever it was, you would destroy people, but it also would, yeah. would turn around and, and your trigger was so, your fuse was so short, whew, then we got Malice yeah. in the palace. Brothers, let me say this very quickly because I've grown up around a lot of people who had anger issues. And most people who have anger issues, it's always just a defense mechanism against the assault that, they've, that they feel like they've experienced growing up, whether it's in their household or in the school system or what have you. And a lot of times that happens because in their household, there's not the appropriate level of regard for the beauty and the importance of the child. I'm not going to be too long-winded on a lot of these issues because I do think that a lot of them can be resolved. A lot of times, children learn about anger and just trying to express yourself through anger in the school system if they come from a healthy household because in the school system, you never know how other children are being raised, how they're being treated, if they're receiving the appropriate amount of love and information and investment. I mentioned this a long time ago. Every child that you, that you have is like an investment. You have to put a lot of money into the child. And that's why I stated in a video that I did, I believe it was the blessed is he that readeth video. That when I was a child, my father and my mother, they invested a lot of money into us to make sure that at the very least, even though we were not rich or anything like that, that we understood that they cared about our welfare. And that's the most important thing. A lot of times I get the sense that a lot of children do not feel like their parents or parent cares about their welfare. And that's why I hone in on the black man. I don't speak to the woman because the woman has been put or placed in a condition that's really not suitable for her as a decision maker. So whenever you come at the woman in a way that's critical, she's always going to try to deflect because she, she's really not supposed to be in that seat in the first place. It's supposed to be the man. So we as men have to stop procreating with females who don't understand things on you know on the level where they should grasp that their actions are going to affect everything that comes after that we as men are supposed to be three-dimensional thinkers so we're supposed to grasp that automatically this very unprofessional very unprofessional dysfunctional you know and 
and then depressed, you know, so many different things. I remember when I was like 22, I, I would be thinking like four different things. I definitely had so much going on in my head, so much frustration. What was not happy? There's a lot in that. There was a lot in there yeah. when I was younger, you know, luckily. And, um, but I was strong enough to identify it and then get help and get help and get help. Well, you, I believe it's in Ecclesiasticus, the 30th chapter, the 21st verse, where it tells us about the heaviness of the mind and how we're supposed to be able to ascend above that. Brothers, don't dwell too much in what they call depression. I know sometimes, at least according to the psychiatric world, they tell you that depression is genetic or that it has some genetic influences. Many times it's because we don't have a vision for ourselves. We don't know where we want to go. And if we don't know where we want to go, we don't know how we're going to get there. The most difficult part of life is figuring out what we want to do with our lives. Once we get that done, we could write down the process. And that's how you keep from, from going into that sphere of what they call depression. You have to have a focus in life. And that's why I also speak on things like what they call, quote unquote, falling in love. Falling in love is is also a mechanism, a stumbling block that's set up for men to become emotionally and spiritually disturbed due to idolatry of a woman. You're supposed to love your woman, care for your woman. If need be, sacrifice for your woman. Make sure that she understands the, the level of the condition of the relationship and be there whenever you can. If need be, give your life for the woman. It tells you that in the scriptures. But to fall in love with her, that's extremely dangerous for both you and her. That's not healthy. And that's one of the main ways that the man ends up in a state of what they call depression. We're all human beings. We all have emotions. But we have to know how to you know, keep those emotions in their place, in a, in a proper contextual aspect. And by the way, just quick point of order. I, I did not know this, but your, your first year, you, you were the 15th overall pick in the first round of the draft. And you go to the Bulls in Chicago, Michael Jordan City. And you get a job part time at Circuit City because you didn't, <laughs> but you didn't trust it. You 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 were still so insecure about. Can I really do this? I need yeah, a second yeah, yeah. job, right? I mean, I was yeah. I, I definitely wanted a second. You know, I, I wanted the discount. I, I never felt. This dude say he want the discount. <laughs> you know, like I never wanted to go back. <laughs> so I'm always like trying to, and I, I didn't want to get in trouble. So I wanted to stay active. I wanted to do some positive things because. Once I have time, then I get in trouble. Yeah. The, you reached out. Why was it so important for you to make amends with the guy that actually threw the beer that started the malice in the past? <laughs> it, it was actually a Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why, why was it so important for you to, to clo I, I guess, to, to close that chapter in your life? I mean, that was a huge part of my life where one guy, I had an incident or a problem with one guy, and it was huge, and home back home when you have a problem with someone it usually ends like in somebody getting hurt somebody mm -hmm. getting shot mm -hmm. and i'm brothers let me also state this because a lot of dumb shit happens over little incidents the scriptures tell us in proverbs i believe it's the 15th chapter in the first verse that a soft answer turneth away wrath you'd be surprised how many crazy situations you can avoid by just saying i'm sorry brother pardon me excuse me thank you are you okay Things of that nature will certainly allow you to avoid a lot of silly shit that dudes right now are locked up for. You have guys doing life in prison because they didn't feel like saying, excuse me. Or people who are six feet underground because they didn't feel like saying, I'm sorry. You don't want to end up like that. It's not worth it. I don't want my life to be like that. I don't want to hold grudges. It was just a problem. I had a problem with one man and it's over fights over and I'm cool. Now I gotta men now I gotta make amends with, you know, my teammates and different things like that. But I felt like the John Green one was very important to me. Just for those who've forgotten, it was November 19, 2004, and there's 20 seconds left in a game and it's early in the year and you had gone to war, quote unquote, with those guys the year before and lost in six games of one of the most physical playoff series probably in the history of this league wouldn't you agree with yeah, that yeah score was 71 like 67 it was all deep <laughs> once again that era 2003 2004 that time period that was the most defensive era in the history of the nba the 1970s and 1980s have nothing on the late 90s early 2000s era of the nba <laughs> defensively 
I think it was 69-65 was the final score. It, it could have been. It could have been. I believe it was. Yeah, it could have been. So now this is the first time you're you're meeting, and you go to their place, and you kick their behinds, and it's 20 seconds left, and you, Ben Wallace, you get into it, you foul them, and then he starts throwing things at you, and and, and again, I'm on your side with this because he's getting. <laughs> He's allowed. Ben Wallace is throwing. He's got hit bands all over him. He's throwing everything on his body at you, and they're they're not throwing him out. They're not even giving him text. So you <laughs> you did what your psychiatrist had advised. Just lay down. Lay down. What's the closest place? It's the scores. <laughs> <table. laughs> Which probably. He also laid down because he ain't want no static with that damn Ben Wallace. That's. <laughs> ben Wallace was ready to turn to William Wallace on his ass. Didn't sit well with the people in the stands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To be winning and anything. Okay. And then the guy who you apologize or you made amends with, John Green. He just he talked to the doc. He was great in the documentary. He's great. He's great. Yeah. He said, "I got a diet coke," and I think, "Well, I'm going to just throw it up in the air." He underhanded it, and I think it was the luckiest shot. It was the a side of that It was guy. a fifty dollar bet. Yeah. Oh, he did the guy bet with the guy right. bet that I can hit you. He's like, "I can do it." He's like, "Oh wow!" And when the guy said, "Oh wow," I owe you fifty dollars. You did it, and when yeah. I see his hand, I'm like, <laughs> "But he did it." Yeah, yeah he thought he was, I thought he hit me with, and, with and, a cup. And, and John Green didn't even know the kid next to him, and so you go up to to lay down the law to that kid, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you yeah. said in the documentary, I didn't want to kill him. I just wanted to kind of put my hands yeah, around yeah. it. I didn't want to kill him. I just wanted to choke him until he stopped breathing. <laughs> and say, you're not going to get away with that because yeah. <laughs> in Queensbridge, you, you can't get away with that. that. Yeah, in QB, Negroes don't take that shit, right, Ron? Let them know. Neighborhood. That's not anger. That's neighborhood. Is that fair to say? It's, fair to, it's fair to say. Yeah. I feel like it, nowhere nobody would let that happen. You know. Um, yeah. I mean, come on. They hit the man with. <laughs> they hit the man with a soda. Something would have happened if anybody got hit like that in any environment. It's very unfortunate what happened when it comes to that. But the NBA needs to do a better job on how they police the crowd. Because you're talking about grown adults there. Things like that are going to occur if they allow the the crowd to become as overly disrespectful as what happened in that game. I wish that Ron Artest, as someone who has so much to lose, had shown better restraint, but, I mean, it's unfortunate. And I feel like, you know, you just can't go around doing that. You see people getting bullied, and I, I don't believe, like, I don't believe people should be getting bullied. I used to be bullied when I was younger at one point in time. You know, so it's like you get you get tired of that right. after a while, and then it stays with you. I can't if you never any, addressed it. How would anybody ever bully you? <laughs> when you're a young kid, you get bullied. Know, yeah. but, then, but that was but that was your way, and then, but you found a way. This is I'm not gonna get bullied. I'm not gonna take this anymore. Yeah. And you toughened yourself up. You grew into the like. Yeah. If it's gonna be some bullying going on, I'm you gonna know, do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> toughened him up with Big Ron, oh, yeah. Dad. <laughs> he took you out, and and he he beat you up on the basketball. Yeah. Court, right. Yeah, he he didn't like. He, he didn't let me get in trouble. I would get spanked when I did anything wrong. Took me on the court and was just like, it would be brutal games out there with my dad. <laughs> a la Denzel Washington and Ray Allen, and he got game. <laughs> a lot of so-called black men, especially from those environments, particularly if they had hoop dreams, they are excessively hard on their son, especially if they know that their son is going to have the DNA to get to 6'5", 6'6", 6'7". Because for the most part, the main difference between someone who's in the NBA as opposed to someone who's not who's of that stature is just drive and will and skill level and I remember being in high school reading about Ron Artest back when he was in high school I remember when he went to St. John's and played alongside of Felipe Lopez so Ron Artest is someone who if you're from the New York area you've heard about him from when he was in high school he was a blue chip prospect so he wasn't letting you win huh no he's not letting me he's built like you (laughs) hitting me and Pushing me in. Well, when, when you said that was the best thing that could have happened yes. to you, right? Yeah, was a, he, he was a, it was weird because him and my mom always were fighting. Yeah. But then on the flip side, he was in my life. Like, you know, I've seen him every day. When they separated, I've seen my dad every day. I can't remember my dad, never seen my dad. Right. Well, that's a great thing. You know, so I'm like, I <laughs> had a little conflict here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to finish the malice at the palace, then you go back on the floor and another fan comes Ooh. right at you. And you say in the doc that if if there hadn't been beer on the floor and you could have gotten your feet underneath yeah. you, that you were slipping, yeah. you might have killed that guy. Yeah, and Jermaine actually got him, but it was really good. I remember that. When Jermaine O'Neal hit <laughs> that dude with the molly wow. Jermaine slipping bust his ass, too. Him, 
because like I was slipping, so I was, I was about to throw the punch, and then I felt like my foot go off my knee. So I had to just throw like a little soft leg, because I didn't want to give too much, and I slipped, and this guy starts getting all over me. So, um, but that was, and he tried to sue us, which was kind of crazy. But it was it was it was like a movie in there. Mm. Probably better than Game of Thrones. And then, <laughs> then you go in the locker room and you had the infamous line to Stephen Jackson. You think we're gonna get in trouble for this? And Stephen, our man Stephen Jackson, just went. Are yeah. we gonna get? No, we're, we're all going to get. We, we're gonna be lucky to have a job. Yeah. I don't know what Stephen Jackson complaining about. That was right up his alley. Stephen Jackson couldn't wait to run up then up in them damn stands. That man. Steven Jackson was up there fighting 20 people like he was Bruce Lee and Enter the Dragon. Right, okay, and then Jermaine is still upset with you for yeah. starting it, and he wants to come at you in the yeah. locker room. Jermaine was mad at me, but then he got in a problem with Coach Carla. I think Jermaine was, like, conflicted at that time. Jermaine's one of the greatest teammates. He always would reach out to me. I never would, like, take him up for lunch or dinner. Mm -hmm. I was just, like, I wasn't secure in myself at that time. Nobody really knew what I was going through at that time. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't... A really good. It seemed like I wasn't a good teammate. I, I played team basketball on the court. Right. You did. I executed everything. Yeah. But just go to to lunch. Call you on the phone. How you doing? I, I never yeah. was engaging like that. Yeah. And Jermaine's quote I wrote down last night was, "Nobody understood Ron, and I don't think he wanted to be understood at that point." I was trying to escape every. I was always trying to escape something. Not just escape. You know, a lot of a lot of times we have trust issues, and it's easy to understand. If you live in this world long enough, you are going to have trust issues. And not just from a, a relationship perspective, just from a life perspective. It can seem as though everyone has an agenda. I get it. But we do have to learn to trust ourselves. That's the main person that we have to learn to trust. Sometimes if, if you'll talk to people long enough and they can tell that you don't have any type of, of you know, spirit where you're trying to utilize uh, trickery or chicanery on them, They'll start to divulge personal aspects about their life because a lot of people just want someone to talk to. So then it will behoove you. And a lot of times that's a test of your character. Are you going to try to use their information against them? Or are you, at the very least, going to tell them, you know what, brother, you probably should not tell me a lot of those things or tell other people a lot of those things because I don't want the responsibility for that or help them in some way. But a lot of times that's a test of your character when people want to try to entrust you with personal information because this is not really a trustworthy world. And the main thing that a lot of us, all of us, can have a problem with from time to time, especially in our formative years, is learning to trust ourselves. That's part of maturation. Fortunately for Ron Artest, he was able to reach a point where he could humble himself enough to be strong because it takes a lot of strength to say, I'm going to go to a psychotherapist. That's, that's pretty much the worldly form of trying to restore yourself mentally and spiritually. Now, for the so-called black man overall, our solution is going to come by returning back to the Most High. A lot of cats don't like when I say that. It is what it is. I really don't care because I know that you have no real alternative. I know you as a worldly person, you have no solution for a spiritual problem, especially you pro-blackity blacks out there. You have no solution for this problem that we have, which is a spiritual problem. You know, like some memory or, or, or some part of their life or what happened yesterday. I wasn't able to say, oh, it'll be okay today. Was it, was it a, a specific incident that you were trying to escape or was it a culmination of your upbringing that you were trying to escape? You know, um, I had my baby early at, at 16. I planned my baby at 16. And then... You planned it? I planned my baby, yeah, my first. I'm not surprised to hear that. He wanted a baby at 16 because... He wanted that woman to stay with him. He was in love probably at 14, 15 years old, and he wanted something that he thought was going to be a stabilizing force and that would always love him from then. A lot of people have children for the wrong reasons. I'm not saying that he did that per se, but a lot of times we say to ourselves, you know, I'm going to have a child because I know the child's going to love me. It's not your child's job. It's not your infant's job to come into your world to make your world better. It's our job as parents to make sure that if and when you bring a child into the world that you can create a, a safe environment for them. That's one of the main reasons why, and there's no disrespect, why well, a lot of those cycles of dysfunction continue because we don't have our shit together before we have a child. So now the child's gonna take on the same demon that we were raised up in. And I knew I always wanted to have kids. Right. And I knew I always wanted to be like with one woman at, one, at once forever. Right. When I got to college, you know, I started experiencing other women. Right. I never been with nobody else. 
So then, right then and there, I had a bad relationship. Right. You know, and then that started spiraling. And then on top of the, my sisters is, is um, psychiatric ward, auntie psychiatric ward, brother psychiatric ward. Then my, my older brother went to jail, 10 years for drug trafficking. It was kind of, it was all crazy for me. And then I just resorted to like, you know, alcohol, marijuana, staying in the hood. And I'm thinking all oh, this is gonna solve problems. Right. It's making it worse right. and worse. And then when I was 21, I had my, I only had one um, nervous breakdown. I was in Chicago, I was on the highway driving to the game. Mm. I had nervous breakdown, 21 years old. Really? Yeah. On pull, a, over or... pull over? Yeah. Pull over. Pull <laughs> over. On my name, Red Hummer. You know, just like screaming, just like, I, you know, it was crazy. And at that point, I'm like, I, I really need to get some help. You you know, brothers, when people have a nervous breakdown, it's like when your car breaks down. Your car breaks down from lack of maintenance. So when you start feeling like there's too much pressure going on in your mind and your life, it's because you're not maintaining yourself well enough. And that goes for all of us, whether it's physically, mentally. Sometimes you have to know when you're in a toxic environment, whether it's a relationship or a job. And that's another thing. I probably need to start a series on that, particularly pretend to the so-called black man. A lot of cats are in these toxic workspaces. And it's really fucking with your life. It's fucking with your outlook. It's fucking with your mindset. You have to figure out what you love to do and what you're good at and start actionizing it. Even if you have to be in that toxic environment for another year, two years, three years, four years, while you're trying to get your life moving towards what your goal is. Life is just a series of goals, man. We all have them. Ain't none of us where, where our goals are. None of us should ever be where our goals are because we should always be setting higher and higher goals once we reach somewhere. When I worked in corporate America, I set a goal for myself that I was gonna be working for myself. Because I knew that my brain was not really, my brain was not configured to be around corporate folk in corporate America. That's not how my brain works. But it took me a period of time to come to terms with that. So that's the main thing holding the so-called black man back. It's not the white man's police force, it's not all that other shit. It's the fact that you're special but you have not come to terms with how special you are. You want to be a regular fucking person. So as long as you want to be a regular person, that's what you're going to be, so-called black man. When you're ready to be higher, then you're going to start moving towards that direction. It's very simple shit. But no, normally, um, when there's a history, like my family has a history of cancer, so I got treatment, got, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I got checked out early. Did you, did you ever think that, okay, I got a brother, got a sister, got an aunt, I got this one? that have mental illness, did you ever think about going to get yourself checked before no. it reached that point? Ne never did. When I was 13, I went to a social worker, mm -hmm. so I was always introduced to it, but I never thought about just getting checked out and, you know, mm -hmm. it, like I do now. Right. You know, or with my, 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 my uh, nephews, right. I would tell them to seek help, mm. you know, early. Right. Yeah, I never thought about that. So the happy ending comes when Kobe Bryant, of all superstars, passes you the basketball and the clothes... He had to. Kobe was, what, 8 for 88 in that game? I mean, shit. Kobe had to pass Ron Artest the ball. Game against Boston, and you shoot and make the three, which was pretty gutsy for you to even take the shot, right? You had your man Lamar Odom from your yeah, childhood. Was he was open over there. <laughs> but you stepped right in. Yeah, they had one of the great AAU squads of all time. They had Lamar Odom and Ron Artest on the same squad. Was it on Pierce? I think it was. It was. It was on Paul Pierce. And you made it. It's the clinching three. And then on the court after the game, you thank your neighborhood and your psychiatrist, which is unprecedented <laughs> for a stand-up interview at the end of a final game, right? Man, I was just so happy. You know, and you wanted to give credit where credit's due. You know, people think they mom. You think God. Yeah. You know, I remember game six, we, we went. We was down 3-2. We won game six. And I remember not talking to the media after the game. I go I go right to Equinox, the one we go to. Right. I was there by 10, 10, and I get a lift in, because I, I didn't want to lift the next day because I didn't want to be tired. So I get the lift in, I'm done by 11, and I woke up the next morning, I had a lot of anxiety. And I remember um, in game six against Detroit, I get a technical foul, game tied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I get a technical foul, they, they make two free throws, they make another bucket, they have four. They win by four and win the finals. Against Kobe, the year before that, I get, I get an elbow, get ejected. Yeah. You know, against Ginobili, mm -hmm. against the Spurs. You did? Yeah. Get ejected. And I'm like, this this cannot happen again. Right. You know, and I called my I called my my psychologist from Houston. She comes up after shoot around, game seven, after shoot around, we talk about about twelve o'clock. 
you know, and then I kind of felt better about that day. Mm. Oof, that so I had work, to think, man. I know it, was, it may have been hard in those moments to tell your story, but truly, it was pretty it is, remarkable It is riveting. Thank you, thank you. And everyone's going to want to make thank sure you. to check out Quiet Pleasure. Storm thank Friday you. night on Showtime. Meta, thanks again. Really appreciate it. We'll thanks for having me. But anyway, that's basically it on that, brothers. Congratulations to Ron Artest for seeking and finding the help that he needed and also learning how to believe in himself and trust in himself. That's a process that we all have to fully immerse ourselves in. It is what it is, but that was volume one of Black Men, Do You Need Help? So if you brothers out there need help, make sure that you do your due diligence in finding it. Because if you don't, you're only going to hamper your own progress. So peace.